And I guess I'm Oh, you just did? Okay, okay. So you weren't talking. Okay, sorry. Okay, try this again. <laughs> hey, you guys need a clicker? There you go. Oh, yes. All right, good evening. I'm Amber Marshall. I'm an instructional coach at Hazel West Middle School. I'm Lauren Fever. I'm a teacher at Campus High School. I'm Kim Hanks, and I teach here at the Middle School. And we are here tonight to share with you some solutions that we came up with within our uh, professional development committee. Um, the committee members were from all over the district. So we had um, we had a district admin, admin from the buildings from all three levels. We had teachers from all three levels and then our AGA rep, which was me. Um, when we first got started with the committee, we decided we came up with these committee standards and that every solution that we come up with had to agree with those four standards. So it had to be ratifiable with staff and the Board of Education, had to be affordable for staff in the district, doable and trackable, and mutual gain. So the initial problem that we came to talk about was uh, whether or not to allow professional development points to move over on um, horizontally on the salary schedule. So our first solution is to not have horizontal movement for professional development points. With that, we need to communicate and educate staff members on the differences between what professional development points go towards and uh, what our credits will go towards. Teachers will still be able to convert any professional development opportunities that they get from the Learning Center or from Mobile Mind through the Wichita State University. And this is something that we plan to revisit in future PD committee meetings. Um, when we started talking about this, some other uh, professional development sort of problems came up that we had some solutions for. So the second one is um, to develop a pre-approved list and flowchart for submitting university credits to the district. Currently, it's a little muddy on what you need to do. So the uh, learning services and personal personnel departments um, agreed that by August 1st, 2023, they will create a list of universities that USD 261 will accept credits from. They will reach out to universities and have them send an example transcript to us so that we can make sure that the transcript is correct for what we have to have to accept the credits from. Um, and this list will be posted for teachers to refer to. Secondly, the learning services and personnel departments will create a flow chart outlining how teachers can get pre-approval for credits uh, for potential future column movement. Um, with that flow chart, depending on who they decide you need to go through for approval, there may be a language change necessary in our negotiated agreement. 
with Article 5, Section C, it's the horizontal movement. Um, some of this wording may have to change depending on what that flowchart says. All right, and then the last solution that we came up with was to review our salary schedule. Um, we have found that there are certain master's degrees that are required for some of our staff members that are actually double what a traditional master's degree requires. So traditionally, it's about 32 to 35 credit hours um, to gain your master's degree. Whereas if you're a speech language pathologist, certain counseling degrees and um, uh, sorry, social workers, they sometimes require almost double that to get your master's, but they still end up in the master's column on our pay scale, even though they had to get double the amount of credits for their master's degree. So we are suggesting that um, a master's degree counts as 35 credits in for the district and then any credit hours you got beyond that in your program, you would be allowed the master's plus. Um, this might also require some additional language changes on the negotiated agreement. And the second part of solution three is to um, look at possibly having a different salary schedule for certain positions like our nurses, special education staff members, social workers, speech language pathologists. And with that, it would require a language change in the definition of teacher in the negotiated agreement. Currently, a teacher includes counselors, special education staff, department coordinators, nurses, um, which are, the definition of teacher is used quite a bit in the negotiated agreement in ways that don't really work for some of the positions on here. So we have um, come up with a solution to possibly change the, um, who is all included in the definition of teacher on the negotiated agreement. Um, and with that, our professional development committee what agreed to continue meeting each year to review any future solutions that might come up, um, just like the first solution of um, us deciding not to have the professional development points count for horizontal movement. We'll review those kinds of things in the future. Thank you. Does the HEA negotiations team have any questions for the professional development? Have you checked with other districts what they do for their staff, like the nurses and social workers? Have you checked around? We have, and uh, certain districts have specific salary schedules for each of those positions. Um, and uh, most often, I think we found that they weren't even included under the teacher um, definition. We've also seen that when we were, when we were talking about that master's plus, there's districts that already do that mm -hmm. have to provide based off of how many credit hours is standard, I guess. Um, so we've looked at some of that language that might be beneficial for us to also be able to attract and keep people around. Mm -hmm. really. um, and uh, then also, I'm just going to add to what she was talking about with the continuation at the um, beginning that we did look at examples of uh, PD conversions from other districts. Um, it's a bit of a beast, we felt like, to really end those few meetings that we had to really come up with something that we could present and say, this is what you should be doing for the following year. And that would follow through with all right. of our right. standards so as well. When we said no movement, I think we were looking at the idea of right now, but we want to come back together and start talking about those and having those conversations and doing more research and digging deeper uh, to see if that is something that we want to try to do in the future. I just think we need more time. Right, and we we looked at a lot of the districts around us and very few of them actually award horizontal movement for professional development points. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for the professional development committee. We appreciate your hard work on that. Okay. Next up, we have the Supplemental Committee. And you guys are live. You can take it over. <laughs> um, I'm Dawn Blue, uh, Assistant Principal at Hayesville Middle School. I'm here with Brandon Johnson, Assistant Principal at Hayesville West. And Lindsay Odout is a science teacher. 
um, at HMS. And um, as you can see by our list of people, we have some people not up here for different reasons. Some are over there. <laughs> um, and we, we took an extensive look at our supplemental salary scale and schedule. And um, it was a daunting task for sure. We met three to four times. Four. Four, yeah, a lot, a lot. <laughs> yes, full days. Um, and what you see up here is what our um, current supplemental salary schedule is. Um, there are 10 levels to this. Um, and it's percentage of the base, as, as you see over on the right. And when we got it, and the numbers behind each of these positions are how many positions are available. So if it's a middle school football coach and there are four positions available, that means I get two and he gets two. Okay. Um, and that became a bit of, uh, we got into the weeds on that a little bit. And we also learned that this is not tiered very well at all. We, we had middle school coaches that were rivaling high school head coaches for salaries, not spending near as much time. And, and so we dug in and um, worked on making a lot of changes. And so we hope we've, we've got a, a good solution. Um, this, this spreadsheet is um, some changes that, um, will be made, we hope to have made to the um, supplemental salary. And I can't see with the, these are the ones that were taken away. Yeah, the ones that were taken away and why um, high school newspaper, that supplemental doesn't even exist anymore. And middle school TV is offered as a class during the day. And middle school assistant weight training, that suppl supplemental wouldn't exist anymore. Um, we added, you see uh, AVID site coordinator and CTE coordinator, uh, link crew coordinators and elementary yearbook. And we uh, got the levels there and we'll see um, uh, a spreadsheet here in a little bit that'll kind of break that down a little bit. We changed some names just uh, to kind of be more parallel and align some things. Um, I'm not gonna go through all those. You can see them right there. I don't think there's a reason for that. Uh, but this just kind of, uh, it's kind of like looking at a research paper and making sure you're parallel in your language. All right, next victim. All right, so as Don stated earlier, um, one of our main goals was just to clean up the salary schedule and make it easier to read, a little bit more user-friendly. Um, we also compared our salary schedule with several districts in the area. Um, I believe some of the ones that we looked at were Derby, Mays, Goddard, uh, Valley Center, and then also schools that are in our middle school athletics league. Um, we felt that it was important that we were competitive with where those districts were as far as how they were paying their coaches. Um, one of the things that we added to the new salary schedule um, is level zero. And we have a lot of our major high school sports listed under that level. Um, that was newly added. And then we also, did we, we added another one at 12. One. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's on the next slide. But we added a level 12 um, to also supplement some of those newly added positions that we incorporated. Um, another thing that we came up with as a group was um, we saw this in a couple different districts around the area, and they base a lot of their coaches' pay off of a percentage of the high school head coaches' pay. Because looking at our old salary schedule, some of the big questions that we had was, well, why does that person get placed at a level four? Why, why is that person placed at a level five? So we really dig, dug into those positions, the amount of time spent um, during those seasons, um, ask questions of those coaches, those sponsors, and we, we tried to place them at what we felt was the appropriate level. Um, the assistant coaches pay at the high school level is going to get 70% of a head coach's um, salary at the high school level. Um, the middle school head coach will also get 70% of a high school head coach in that area. And then a middle school assistant coach will get 55% of the high school head coach's pay. Um, that just kind of helped 
clean up some of those numbers and, and be more specific on what people are getting paid. Yes, yes. Um, like she stated earlier, if you coach two middle school sports, for example, we have split seasons in basketball and wrestling. The middle school basketball head coach at our school is making more than our high school head coach. We don't feel that's fair um, for the amount of time that they've spent and put in. There really was no solution to fix that as far as we felt um, because we can't cut their pay that drastically. We So uh, one of our solutions to that was to, to increase their pay and move them over a level. So that's why we created the level O or level zero. Um, this next slide just highlights some of the lower levels here. Um, yeah, and we took away the numbers like Don stated earlier. Um, Jillian thought that it was important for us athletics directors to have the, the say in how many coaches we feel we need. So we didn't want to be handcuffed by putting a number there. If we have a, a, a large track team and we feel like we need to hire another coach to help run practices and, and maintain, you know, safety of practice and stuff like that, we'd have the freedom to do so. So that's why we decided to take the numbers off of here. Um, can I click on this hyperlink? Yeah. Oh, this this here is a little hard to read, but but the but the red and the green basically highlights the differences in pay. Um, so the the red numbers up here were the positions with the new formula that we came up with that would be losing money essentially from what they were currently at. Um, yeah. Yeah. And going through all these positions, we tried to make sure that, you know, we weren't cutting them drastically to where it wasn't attractive for people to want to do those positions, but also to maintain competitiveness with other districts around the area. So I know it's hard to see, but that highlights all of our supplementals that we currently have and the percentage of change. And the ones in red would be the ones that would be losing money. So. Yeah. How do I go back? <laughs> I don't want to screw it. Back here. Okay. All right. Okay. I think this is I'll me. Let Lindsay take over. <laughs> All right. So I believe this is our um, current. I'm sorry. This is our new. Um, I'll click on our current um, sections N and O, uh, which covers our uh, additional days and this used to be where our department heads um, were. Well, we, if you couldn't see in the back, I'm sorry, uh, they are included now onto our uh, supplemental salary schedule. So they're actually in one of those uh, columns um, instead of being their own entity in section N here. Um, and the reason we did that is we looked at a lot of different di districts and they also include them in their supplementals. Um, and we did the same thing where high school, um, I think I can click on this. No, I'm sorry. High school, help me out here. Was it, uh, I believe it was cores um, were at a higher level and then electives were at the next level down and then middle school cores were at that same level as high school electives. And then middle school electives would be one level further down from that. Um, and all those positions would be getting um, an increase in pay uh, for those positions. Um, the other positions here under section N, um, didn't change much. The only thing I believe that we took off um, was, if I go to the current one here, we can see. You can see how messy this was, but I believe we took off the district fine arts um, coordinator because I believe that position is no longer um, a thing or it's included within uh, the choir and uh, band. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, down in section O, uh, we did spend a lot of time looking at this. Um, we did say we spent four days doing this, but we also had, we sent out emails to all these um, positions and asked, you know, how much time are you putting into this? What, how many hours? Um, and so we got a lot of feedback from, I believe, Angie and um, some of the SPED on this too, uh, but we cleaned it up um, and did have to take away um, some of the days just depending on uh, what we felt was necessary and reasonable. So I'm going to go back here. How do we go back again? Yep, perfect. 
So librarians, we cleaned this up. I think it's on the last one. I think there was several of them here. We just said elementary schools, middle and high school. Um, all of these went from 10 days down to five. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about what our librarians do and how many days we, we thought was necessary for them. Um, and that's where we came to the conclusion. Um, counselors, I believe if you saw on the current one, there was like, I don't know, five counselors, maybe six positions, because it kind of got a little muddy there as far as I think some of those days weren't correct uh, for several of those counselors. And so uh, we said high school would just get us um, even 20, middle school, even 15, elementary is 10. Um, I think the other things here, we removed um, special education scheduling. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Angie, in this, but I believe that position has been absolved. Um, the scheduling, special education scheduling. Okay. All right. Well, we, I think, really, really we're under the impression that it was. Um, so we can come back and look at that because um, I don't have any notes on that, Julian. So, and then I believe that we changed the name from um, occupational therapy to assistant, uh, assistive technology. Um, we added nurses because they needed to be on here because um, they weren't on there previously. And I believe that's about it there. Again, we looked at a lot of different districts in this when we were making these decisions and it was really hard to take, again, not the people and just look at the positions and what they were doing. Very, very, very difficult task for us. So, questions? How does the summer camp thing work for these coaches? Summer, how's that being paid? Budget. So currently our coaches uh, clock in in the summertime and if they're running a, a team camp, say for, you know, that day, they clock in when they get there, they clock out when they get there. And I believe the hourly rate for that is $25. Or I think that is part of what increased. It's now at $16. I think, I think the 16 hour, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these guys, these people have to apply for this or have to make, is there a number of coaches that are involved? How does that work? There, there are current coaches on staff. Yeah. Um, we, we don't just hire random staff members or people across the district to come in. They're, these are the coaches that will be working with kids and athletics next year. Right. And those camps are free of charge to yeah, all of our kids. Are, so they're not, you they're know, not the, the coach isn't is charging them a camp to be no, right. And then in turn clocking in also and yeah. essentially double dipping. The camp's totally free. Kid, any kid can come. And, yeah. Seems like it used to be some places like that. Yeah. 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 So I mean, I think there's like a high school volleyball camp, but I think that's separate from their like. Regular. Well, I mean, for, for years we've had set numbers. Um, you know, a lot of our a lot of our uh, middle school sports teams have, like, you know, two. Uh, the bigger ones like track have numerous numbers, but um, we we're not going to decrease those numbers, but we would. You know, like the transparency to be able to increase if it was needed, if it was necessary. You mean in the summer? Oh, he's just talking. Oh, summer. the summer. Oh, so for for our mornings, our early mornings, which is just weights and conditioning, I have three. Um, I have three. We have three. We've had four in the past, and last year they were like, I, I think we can do this one three. And so, and then as far as volleyball, we'll have all four volleyball coaches there with the girls. Sometimes, yeah, give or take. Give or take. Like I'm, I'm taking a group to Florida, so I'll be gone for one of the days. So they'll be running it without me that right. day. Um, but we kind of trade off. Like I'm covering another time where somebody else is gone. So. And we don't have all, uh, all sports represented, represented in the summer. Um, track doesn't work out. Soccer doesn't work out. Wrestling doesn't. So we're not paying all of our coaches. Any other questions from the negotiations HA team? Do you guys have a paper copy on the last business? We were told not to pay one. We, to one we, can, we can get you that. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll get them out. <laughs> it's hard to memorize. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it was it was hard to put on there. So <laughs> right. you know, that's easy things. Yeah. Yeah. 
so yeah, he was the younger so was uh, Amy did too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can get you a copy yeah. of all the proposals, the four full sheets. Any other questions you guys have? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the supplemental team for all of their work. We appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. And while we're transitioning to the next one, I do want to preface that one thing we talked about with all of the committees is that we are making suggestions. So we understand that all of this is being taken to the negotiations team and the negotiation team makes the final decision on what gets presented to the bargaining unit. So everything that we're presenting today through these committees is just a suggestion of what they came up with. Next up, we have the committee that worked on class size. Hi, um, I'm Priscilla McShane. Um, I'm a math teacher at HMS. Um, I'm Mandy Faust. I teach third grade at Ruth Clark. Um, we also had uh, Walter Zmanik and, uh, and then a few other um, admin with us um, while we were there. Um, and this is kind of the uh, presentation that um, Jen was so awesome to put together that led our discussion and that we added to as we were going through um, uh, as we talked about class size. Um, so. Um, I'm just going to click. There we go. So these were some of the I, things that popped up as we were uh, our original brainstorm. Here are the things that just kind of said, this is why this was a problem um, and why we wanted to talk about it. So at the elementary level, I know in our building, fourth and fifth grade tends to be our bigger classes. So I went to those teachers and just asked their opinions. What are some of the issues that you're seeing and these top three um, bullets were kind of their, their input. Um, they each have about 27 kids in their classes. Um, their students every year we're seeing more and more behavior and more needs and it just makes the case a little bit more tough. And then uh, they're saying that 125 just is not as manageable as it used to be. Oh, and then the lack of curricular resources. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we don't always get enough for, you know, we have what we think is coming and then we're show up in the roles and then we're short on materials and getting those resources is just difficult. Um, and resources, the curricular resources can also be seen at the secondary level, um, specifically sometimes uh, middle school. We see that more, um, I would say, in the... Um, math and language arts, we might have manipulative issues, not having enough for class sets. Um, if we need to be able to uh, have, if we have bigger class sizes. Um, one of the issues at the secondary level um, is we don't have enough teachers um, to give our core, uh, to give our core class teachers um, smaller class sizes. Um, thankfully, in the last year or so, we've have been able to have smaller class sizes in our math department because we um, have been able to get an additional math teacher. But if I look at my uh, coworker who's in social studies, she had 35 to my 20 last school year um, in one at the same time as my next door neighbor in, uh, in uh, computer science had another 35. Um, so um, the amount of teachers that we have to the amount of students that we have um, not necessarily matching up some of the brainstorming that we kind of did at the in, at this point was maybe we could add additional levels um, to that double dipping in our reading and our mathing our math our mathing um, some of our kids who struggle academically um, who are right there in the middle they're not quite to the top not quite to where they need to be but not super low maybe we need that extra level um, and having an extra level of teachers a lot would have maybe allow us to do that. Um, at the high school level, um, they have a very unique situation of having the IB courses, CTE courses, they're incredibly small. They might have less than 10 in a class, but then they, you go to a weights class and they have over 60 in the same class period. Um, so we see lots of teachers who those are, it just causes problems and we just kind of wanted to see how we could 
like those are problems that can lead to inequity in our classrooms that kind of why we wanted to look at all of this. So, um, so considerations as we measured solution, as we were for that we've for measuring um, our solutions were behaviors, um, different special education needs, our ESOL needs, funding. Um, specifically tiering our, our math and reading, our support staff availability, um, reassigning based on need and space. I know that was a specific one at our elementary level. Space is a little bit broader at our middle school level, but the space is a difficulty in building with. We have two sections, the fourth grade and fifth grade, and adding a third would be ideal, but we don't have classrooms for them. So um, those were all the things as we were thinking about our uh, consider uh, what we were talking about as we were going. So um, we have some great data miners in our group. Um, and this was some of the data that was pulled um, that as we started talking. Um, so these are our district class size averages by the building. Um, so as you see, um, Campus High School, they have 22.4, but do you think about those tiny classes, the special education CTE IB, um, averaging out with those 60 member classes. Um, at the middle school level, 17 at HMS, 15.6 at HW. Um, again, having smaller class sizes from our SPED side, from the SPED side of things, um, definitely um, lower, I lowered our averages we did ask I don't we don't have it in our presentation um because um we didn't work I don't know where where it's at right now we'd but like we, we asked we'd like to have the information as to what that uh what those averages would look like without those super small classes because I know those averages would be up. yeah we just like to rework those numbers and and take out those outliers the really big classes the really small classes to get it to the representation what those classrooms actually are. Um, all of those links that are on this presentation um, are, um, you can class size information from other districts inside the state, seeing um, where they, um, do they draw the line at a specific spot um, or do they not? Um, and I don't remember exactly which district, but there is a district in the state of Kansas that draws the line at 45 in a class. Um, not very many districts have um, actual Yes, no. Um, but the other lines are looking nationwide and why class size is important. So that was the data that um, added there. So here are our recommendations. So currently our class size is restricted to 27 at fourth grade level. And at that number, that's really just a place where the principal and administration come together to say, what do we need to do? How do we change that? It's not an actual hard, we can't enroll anymore after that number. So we'd like to lower that to 25 and start looking at that point. What are we going to do to keep it from getting higher? Um, moving pre-K and the lower grades, K3, at their levels of their recommended sizes of 20 or 23. Um, K6 administrators currently have um, they do have the ability to make those changes um, uh, in staffing, but making sure they are aware that they have the flexibility to move staff appropriately um, based on those class sizes. So should we need a teacher to um, move with a cohort? So maybe one year they taught, once we had, maybe you have an abnormally small fifth grade class but you have an abnormally large first grade class, move one of those fifth grade teachers down to first grade. And for that entire class's time, that teach maybe it's up to that administrator to move, to make those decisions inside that building. Um, and maybe that also means at the middle school level, case uh, sixth grade, um, most middle school student or middle school teachers are certified sixth grade or the sixth grade, especially, um, we can say, hey, we we need another person from West. We need a couple more people from West or West could say, hey, we need one of your teachers because we need, we have a 
population boom in our in our district lines. So a, a the flexibility to move those staffs from building to building. So maybe Rex needs somebody or Ruth Clark needs somebody to keep our things uh, like it's written. Administrators have the power. So to speak. Um, they just maybe need reminded that that is something that can be done to help. So let me. Um, then also new and returning limited open enrollment um, are placed based on class size specific to elementary. Um, so we only are allowing open enrollment when there's a, a space for those students. Um, trying to keep in mind that we may still have students move into our districts during our, our boundary lines during the school year. Um, so just keeping that in mind as we allow a that was and our final recommendation is that for high need content areas um, that we reimburse staff for the cost of the praxis test upon completion um, and if after it's added to their license um, the specific idea behind this one was um, on ESOL but not that it could also be you have a middle school um, math teacher who need we you need another social studies teacher asking them to get certified in social studies Exactly. Potentially, the it would allow for more of this flexibility of staff. Um, and these recommendations are for changes in Board of Education policy, not in the negotiated agreement, which I know is a lot harder on your guys's aspect on your guys's front. But those are our recommendations. Any questions? Did you think survey teachers like let's say K through three uh, and that's What's what's a good number for them? Yeah, anybody there? They didn't like. I I spoke with our fourth and fifth grade teachers in our building. Uh, Twenty five seems to be kind of their max before they're overwhelmed with the caseload and just the space in the classroom itself is conflicting. Um, a survey did not happen at the middle or high school level, but as you know, we teach multiple hours a day. Got to the grading and all of the additional course load of that um, is multiplied by six, eight hours, depending on how many classes you're teaching. So, yeah, exactly. Well, um, and I think one thing that when we looked back at these numbers um, at the elementary, I think one of the reasons why we kind of said, hey, let's keep those K, the, the K3 numbers at 23. If we're looking at where our class averages are right now, we aren't even hitting 20. Yeah, we've got some classes like at her school. In our building, I don't think there's any K3 that are over 20. So I'm not certain if that's how that is. So if we were to change that, putting undue hardship, adding an extra position, mm -hmm. if we're thinking funding as part of our, as, uh, as one of our me measures. Can you guys tell me where that data come from and what you are from? Um, it's in Manic House. The information, um, and he said he pulled it straight from Power School and it was the show. I don't, I don't. I would tend to, you know, when did Walter pull the data to create this? Do you remember if it was this year or last year's data? Mm -hmm. We met in February. We also have more recent data from May that we have to share with the and that's just a simple email address. So it hasn't been disaggregated according to a four classes or hey, we're going to take out as a two teacher, that's basic data, basic data, so that we're looking at just four class because yeah, in middle school, I've never had a class that had less than 25 kids in yeah. three years. So that clearly is not accurate. Yes, that would include you. And so I'd like to see it disaggregated into different categories where it's a lot more reflective of the reality. That's the data that we we asked for when we first talked um, in February. 
um, and I know you said that it has been pulled and you've, and it's been disaggregated a little bit. We yeah, I saw that number in the meeting and I said, um, that must include our SPED classes because I know that they are, you know, five, less than 10. I've, this year I happen to have, my class sizes are less than 15 based off of the type of class I teach. Um, so, but I'm math and I, we have that extra teacher, your language arts mm -hmm. and you get a lot. So, this one, recommendations. We currently have recommendations for a fourth and grade, but those right there are 27 kids. So when we go beyond 27, there's not really repression or any kind of consequence or change is happening. And I guess that's what we were hoping somebody would make a suggestion. Once we hit that 27, then what? Would you guys have And then ask the administrators. Yep. Yeah. Um, right now, currently, if we go over the recommended number, which would be 27, 45, 23, K3, um, pre-K, we just said at 20 this year. Right now, if we go over that, then we do meet as a teacher's level team, and we meet with that uh, building administrator and those teachers, and we determine how we're going to proceed. Um, so if they're just fluctuating at like one class size 28, one class size 27, which is met it, would this be taken care of with an additional support personnel as far as like a paraprofessional? It may not result in hiring another teacher, but it will result in offering additional support at that grade level, and it has been met consistently. That's, that's our policy right now. This, as soon as that hits, we have a meeting and determine how to support that. Um, we also have what's called a seats and seats meeting on the first day, the first official day of school where all elementary students are actually in their seat. And uh, the elementary principals come to that meeting with all of their numbers and that's how we determine do we need additional support, do we need any additional teachers, um, those types of things. Because right before that, we have the idea of what the assignment is, so they're actually in the seats with elementary. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So, our class slide is going to be to appreciate you, ladies. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have discussed plan periods, and we actually have two different committees that have talked about plan periods. So, Jen Reed, we'll start us off. Hi. So as you know, I'm Jennifer Reed, Assistant Superintendent for Learning Services. And this first plan period committee was basically to develop a policy that we didn't have. So when we looked at uh, particularly paid plans and how much the district was spending on that, there was no policy in place to determine who got a paid plan, when they got a paid plan, how they got a paid plan. So to get us all on the same page, we pulled together all of the um, building administrators we had all counselors, we had a representative counselor from every secondary building, so we made sure that some were still at the building level. So uh, they usually put their like department chair counselor came in and then um, myself, I led, I led the meeting. So we talked about the process um, that was currently in place, which was none. And then we talked, we, we grouped into different levels to determine how we would have a process for future years, just so we can go back to that um, as we're de developing paid plans. And it is a pretty simple process. Um, I just thought I'd go over it with you. So for, for elementary, um, currently right now, elementary paid plan periods are covered by all of our special education staff. We do not have any general education teachers that get paid on their plan time. So uh, the staff will gather data and information uh, from available resources with special education, and then they'll determine if coverage is an option with the current staff that's provided, or if it needs to come from a paid plan. And then that principal from that building will meet with the director of special education and determine um, how the supports will come from a paid plan. For the secondary level, again, this applies. Um, middle school does not have any general education teachers on a paid plan at this time. They're all special education teachers. So that would still apply. That process would apply. They would determine the need. Then that principal will reach out to the director of special education and work with the director to determine how those paid plans will be met. And then for general education um, paid plan periods, the um, assistant superintendent for learning services, whoever that may be, will meet with the principal and any pertinent staff to determine if a paid plan is needed. So how that looked this year was I attended all of the department chair meetings. 
Um, we looked at the preliminary numbers. It was me, uh, the counseling department chair, the principal, and then the department chair of that specific department. We discussed the needs, we discussed enrollment, we discussed preliminary numbers, and then numbers of uh, students that had that on their alternate list. We talked about how many sections were needed of different classes, what classes we could make, tried to keep the classes at a minimal level, and then determine how many paid plans in each department we needed. So in a nutshell, um, going forward, the building will determine the needs, then that building principal will either reach out to the assistant superintendent for learning services if it's a general education paid plan or the special education director if it is a special ed paid plan. Any questions? Well, kind of related to the last video. Sure. They kind of both go together. Yeah. Was there kind of a class size like number for like, I know at high school obviously it's hard because there's so many different things, but let's just say core classes. Mm -hmm. When you're determining that, like, is there kind of a number that you're like, yeah, let's keep it under this number? When we decided we were more of uh, what makes a class than overage on a class, if that makes sense, because we were looking at how many kids would make a class to get a paid plan necessarily. And so uh, speaking with uh, the, the counselor and the uh, principal, we thought 25 was a good round number to look at making a section. Um, and a lot of that did fall onto some of the electives because a lot of kids love the amount of electives that are offered at campus high school. You guys offer a ton of different avenues. However, unfortunately, with the staff that you have, you just can't provide it all. Um, I did personally, and, and so did uh, the principal and the counselor, try to keep classes under 30. So, I mean, I know that's a, a window to make a class, but most classes made. So then we would try to figure out how many sections of those classes could offer we could offer while keeping classes under 30. Now, I will say we were flexible in a couple of um, our department meetings. The department said, the department chair said, you know, we absolutely need to offer this class and this class did not make it 25. Um, then I then we just talked about, okay, so what are we willing to give? And this particular um, teacher said, you know, I teach this. So if I can teach this class uh, and it, it's still small, then we can add over 30 to mine. And so we changed a couple of sections there. So this, this class was able to make, even if it's under 25, but then this teacher in particular was willing to take about 32 to 33 in that class to offset it. That might be more than you wanted to know. No, 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 that's, that's for, no, that's for, uh, no exactly. I was curious. Did you guys look at anything like uh, kind of like total numbers for some teachers, like as far as like total caseload or anything? Like I'll that? be honest, we did not. Okay. That's cool. But that can be something um, that we're involved in next year. Um, I, I really appreciated being a part of the process this year. I think I learned a lot. Um, and so, I, and I, I just enjoyed it. So it's dynamic. We'll continue to meet. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. And along with paid plan, we also, um, so that committee discussed the policy. The next committee that is coming up discussed, um, one thing that came up during negotiations was the discrepancy in pay and equity, the time. And so this committee focused on that. Let's take it away. I am Grant Jones. There were several on our 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 team, and you'll see that in a minute. I am Grant Jones. This is Jill Rausch. Um, the purpose was to look at the equity of time and the equity of compensation for uh, plans. This is everybody that was on the committee. So there was some discussion about the content of the committee, but this is who we were. Uh, pretty good representation around. Uh, I don't exactly know how everybody was picked, but we were. Um, so this is, again, we did, I, I know everybody went through a similar uh, strategy and structure of, of the thing. So we did the same steps that everybody else did. We did a data review. We identified issues. We looked at standards, which is the same standards that everybody else has mentioned. Um, we discussed solutions like our brainstorming, then we voted on them. So it's really, it was that, that, that simple. It wasn't uh, super complicated. We were just trying to come up with some solutions. This was the beginning of our process, or part of it was crunching some numbers, and this was part of our data review. This is how much we paid for pl paid plans. Uh, I believe that was last year, or was that this year? That's this this year. Uh, 
Um, so that's how it broke down at each each level. And again, it showed um, pretty much everywhere, but um, the high schools, it was uh, all sped. Then the examples of um, <clears throat> what the uh, plan was for each level, elementary was at six, about 60 minutes per day, middle school 48, and campus was at 82 minutes per day. So that's where, again, some of our, our discussion started was that's a huge disparity across the three levels. Um, and how can, we, how can we fix that? How can we address some of those? So when we identified the issues, we went through these seven items, and you guys have those. Um, the amount of plan time per week we thought was an issue. The salary that's paid to teach a section on your plan time was obviously a big discrepancy for each building. Uh, the use of plan time, the lack of substitutes, we know that's been an issue this year. Staff who do not have a plan, like nurses, counselors, social workers, does a class size that you have justify getting an extra plan period? And then of course the cost effectiveness of giving additional plan time, especially at the middle school, since there's that huge discrepancy. And then these are the ones that everyone's talked about. We had needed to make sure that this was all gonna match up to whatever we recommended. And then these are the solutions that we came up with. We could add plan time at the middle school level. We could add more specials or elective teachers at either the elementary and middle level to give those teachers an additional plan. We could start with a district early late start. We could change the plan time language in the negotiated agreement, reduce plan time at campus, remove block schedule at campus, or um, and finally use a formula or a supplemental for teachers that are teaching on their plan. Um, when we voted, each committee member got four dots. They went through all of those. Um, ideas or solutions, and they voted on what they thought was the best option for us moving forward. And then our two recommendations, number one was to reduce plan time at campus high school. And then the other one was to utilize or create a formula to determine how much we are gonna pay a teacher to teach an additional section on their plan. And a lot of that revolved around what percentage of their day are they given up? You know, if they have so many minutes that they are on duty at school, how much of, of, of a plan are they giving up? So, well, th this one here too caused a little bit of a thing because currently a person gets a percentage or a fraction of their salary. So, as a teacher who's been in the district a long time, I, I, you know, am farther on the pay scale. But if a first year teacher moves into the door next to me and they decide to teach on their plan, we are essentially putting in the same amount of hours per day, but I'm getting compensated by a lot more for giving up my plan time. And so we thought that adding that to the supplemental schedule would make more sense. And then, of course, if they wanted to divvy that out, whether you are teaching, you know, chemistry or physics compared to, you know, adding a weight class. But that was our recommendation. Any okay. questions? Have the other recommendations and the number of us are requesting? Yep, I have those. Is that on your on the sheet? Um, or I we don't have know if it is, but I can give you that right now. So I think add plan time to the middle school was the very first solution that we came up with. That got eight votes. Add more specials or elective teachers was five. We eliminated and did not even vote on district early or late start. We've done that in 261 before, and it was not well received. We didn't think it addressed the issue either. Yeah, and we did not think it would address because that's only going to give you one day a month, generally, or one day a week, depending on how you do that. It's not going to fix your discrepancy. Part of that was to address the concern, I think, about some people that have to do their uh, PLCs during their one plan a week or a couple plans a week. And, and so the earlier late start, somebody said maybe that would help, but we decided it really wouldn't help our issue at all. And then changing the plan time language in our negotiated agreement got two votes. 
and then reducing plan time at CHS was 16. Removing block schedule at campus got zero votes. No one thought that that was a good idea. And then of course the 13 votes on the, the last solution. There's a lot of discussion back and forth on all this. It was not, not as simple as what it looks on the floor. I didn't in my building because we have a di we have different you know situations at, at HHS. So it's, it's been an ongoing different. discussion, I think, between your elementary and middle level teachers compared to your teachers at campus. At the middle level, when we split into two buildings, uh, we eliminated our middle school team time or team planning time. Uh, just because of staffing issues. So that is where the discrepancy came from at that, right at that time. We used to get the same amount that campus teachers did, but that went away when we split into two schools. I hear a lot that uh, if teachers would just be allowed to have their plan time, they might be happier because they're pulled into so many extra meetings. Um, at the middle level, we're not pulled into any other meetings. Oh, yeah, I think definitely at elementary, that's a but problem. Today, it's about we're pulled in for 15, 20 minutes. Their plan time is gone. It's, you know, crazy days today. Yeah. That's what's cool. But I think people might be happier if they could just. Well, I think we'd all be happy if we'd all got 82 minutes. And I believe part of the issue also at, at the high school level, I know it is at our school, you know, we're not, we're still rebounding from COVID to get subs. And so we have teachers that have to say, I can't sub on my plan today. I have too many things to do. Because we're being asked almost on a daily basis to to teach on our plan because there's just no subs. So I think we plan a lot of this stuff on in service days or something like that. I think it didn't help. That's there's not that many in service days. No. <laughs> I make use of them. Right. I still don't that's still I'm thinking if that wasn't gonna be a solution that really oh, would no, fix just, the just say what I hear. Right. Yeah. So did you feel like the middle schools would be, uh, they would like to kind of go back to the, how it used to be before they split and have the team time? I think we'd love it, but we didn't get to vote on that. That wasn't an issue that was brought forward through any type of negotiations. That was just eliminated. And, oh, and way back when, yes, when they opened HM. Yes. Right, they, they just eliminated that. And I think it's something that we would love, but it's not affordable because of the number of staff that we would have to hire and we don't have any room for them. Like it, for example, at HW, we don't have an extra classroom right now that's not being utilized. So that wasn't discussed with any of us. We discussed it. We just didn't even, it didn't even come up as a suggestion because they were, we thought it would be way too expensive. Well, we did. You know, we have the five. Add things. additional plan time at the middle school was that. Well, one yeah, it wasn't one of the things that got voted on, but got yeah. like two votes or something. We knew that it would not, it, it wasn't going to be affordable, which was one of our standards that we set when we went to vote on this. Yeah, the affordable part, I don't I'm going back. backwards. That one right there. So the uh, one of the things, the mutual gain thing, we were afraid that might also cause more problems than it would solve. Um, trying to go in that direction. So well, you'd also have to add time to the elementary level. Yeah, so there's still well, a discrepancy. Even if we gave the middle school teachers, then our middle school and our campus teachers would still have more than our elementaries did by 22 minutes. I know, but I, I feel like there needs to be a discrepancy. I mean, at least from elementary to high school, we don't see as many students. So I, I would be willing to the most of them. Well, I mean, it, you know, I don't think that everyone in the committee that was an elementary teacher had that same mm -hmm. opinion. So, how many elementary ones? Two. Uh, and they mean. talked to people at their building. Two. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much to the plan time committee for coming up.
Um, and I do just want to preface that when we had the committees, we, we did try to do on the professional development committee and the plan time committee, we did try to do an equal number of staff. So we had two teachers at each level, two elementary, two middle, two high school. We had one administrator, building administrator from each level, and then other pertinent people, depending on the committee that we were talking about. And then HEA also designated a representative, and that representative could be at the elementary, middle, or high school level. The class size committee that we discussed earlier, that committee was part of our negotiations process. So that is something that we talked about, and that was an amendment that we had as part of our negotiated agreement this year. And that amendment determined who was going to be on that committee as well. And then the supplemental committee is actually part of our negotiated agreement that we organize every year. And so that was dictated by the negotiated agreement as well. HEA negotiations team, do you guys have any other questions for our committees? All right. Thank everyone for coming out. And I'm sorry for those of you viewing online. We ran about five or six minutes late. We had some technology, technology difficulties. So thank you for your patience. And thank you everyone for joining either in person or online today. Have a great evening. Thank you.